Oops. That shouldn't be there. Okay. Yeah. So, well, thank you very much for the invitation, for the introduction, uh, and for the opportunity to talk about uh, quantum optics and quantum information with superconducting circuits. Um, in sort of this lecture today, I want to give you uh, an introduction on you know, what these uh, quantum circuits are, how we can think of them, how we can quantize them, how we can slowly build up systems that we can then use for quantum information processing and quantum optics. Maybe just as a short, um, uh, doesn't work? oh, battery is empty, that's great. Um, as a short uh, introduction, what I'm working on. So in Innsbruck, we are working on sort of experiments uh, towards using these uh, superconducting uh, circuits for quantum simulation uh, to build large structures which we can use for amplifiers and also try and couple them to uh, micromechanical systems in the end, um, which can be used for sensing applications uh, or also to test quantum physics. Um, so you uh, get these uh, slides so you can download them from the homepage. Um, um, I've already have a version up there. This one is a slightly modified one. I X'd out some typos and so on. Um, I'll send the modified one, absolutely. Um, um, so just as an um, starter, here's some very nice references, and you know this is by no means a complete list. Uh, so up top you have uh, lecture notes by Rudolf Groß and uh, Achim Marx from the Walter Meissner Institutes, which are really great if you want to know more about low temperature physics and superconductivity in general. Uh, then there's uh, a set essentially of, of lecture notes from the Zouge lectures, one by Steve Gervin and the other one by Michel Deveret which has been recently uh, redone and put on the archive on superconducting circuits, how to quantize them, uh, how to build qubits, and so on. And then there's these uh, three uh, references down there which tell you more about sort of state of the art of superconducting qubits, circuits, how to do quantum information with them, how to build up interesting systems. Um, one thing I really want to also mention is this last IBM quantum experience who knows about it already? Okay, quite some. So who doesn't know it, check it out. Uh, it's your chance to run your algorithms on a real superconducting quantum computer. And I think at the moment there are up to 15 qubits you can control or something like that. So this is really nice. Um, and it's really well implemented. So check it out. Um, okay. Now, um, as we are going to talk about superconducting circuits, um, I just very, very briefly want to talk about superconductivity and just, you know, a little bit also I have to talk about Josephson effect because that's sort of the main ingredient we need to build up these circuits. Um, so we want to have superconducting uh, um, uh, material, superconducting elements because we want to in the end build qubits which have very long coherence times which don't lose any energy. So superconductor is great because if I cool this material below a certain temperature, it will become superconducting, it will lose all electrical resistance, among other properties, um, and um, there's essentially no dissipation there. So now superconductivity comes about because my, Cooper pair, my electrons essentially form Cooper pairs. Um, so these electrons, um, they can uh, interact with the lattice of, of my material, they can exchange bosons and they can form this pair. Now, these uh, phonometer interactions are typically on the range of about 100 nanometers. So if you think about sort of your, your whole lattice, your whole uh, material, you'll have a lot of Cooper pairs there. So the volume of a Cooper pair is about 100 nanometers cubed. Depends a little bit on the superconductor. And what is important about these uh, electron pairs is that they are momentum anticorrelated. That's what makes them a Cooper pair. Um, just to give you some numbers, uh, so um, typically uh, per Cooper pair volume, we have about 10 to the 6 uh, electrons around. Uh, so in this 100 nanometer squared, so there's quite a couple uh, electrons there. And because now uh, these Cooper pairs are effectively bosons, so they can 
uh, condense into a coherent quantum state, uh, and I can describe them with a macroscopic wave function, where this, um, uh, uh, here's a point, does that actually work? Maybe not. Um, so uh, you can have this uh, macroscopic wave function where this psi zero, or actually psi zero squared, just tells you about the number density. So how many Kubo pairs are around, and then you have this additional phase factor there which can vary across the material. But it's a really uh, uh, quantum description of this whole system, and it's a really macroscopic wave function. So, so this is sort of the physics behind it that this really allows us uh, to uh, you know, have these Cooper pairs and uh, have sort of dissipationless current flowing. So maybe this doesn't really explain why there is no dissipation anymore. So I think a very nice picture is the following. So uh, think about sort of a Fermi surface. Um, um, so on the left, sort of this is just a cut, sort of a two-dimensional cut, cut through this uh, uh, Fermi sphere. Um, and I apply a current. That means that my whole uh, uh, sort of Fermi surface is displaced sort of towards one direction. Um, now for simple electrons, they can still scatter with my lattice, with, with the atoms that are around, and what will happen is they will sort of slowly relax to the left, and that will sort of make my current die out over time. But what happens now for Cooper pairs is, because they are correlated, so they have this strong momentum anti-correlation, I should say, um, is that whenever one of those electrons scatter, uh, and for, for example gets scattered to the left, the other one has to be scattered to the right. That means that this whole displaced Fermi surface cannot relax back to the ground state. So really what makes sort of this supercurrent live forever is this very strong momentum correlation. So this is really a quantum effect we are seeing here that keeps um, superconductivity working. Um, okay, so, um, so we have these Cooper pairs. Uh, they can flow completely dis dissipationless through our material. Um, another sort of very important thing we will need in the following in later lectures is the so-called Josephson junction. Now, uh, this junction is essentially a sandwich of a superconductor, a very thin insulating barrier, typically something like a nanometer, and another superconductor on the right. Uh, now, the superconductor on the left and the superconductor on the right, I have to describe again with this macroscopic wave function. Uh, so I will have Cooper pairs uh, and in both of those uh, superconductors, and it turns out they can actually tunnel through this barrier. So this barrier is typically an oxide or something, uh, so normally this would be like a resistance. But it's so thin that actually my Cooper pairs can completely dissipationless tunnel across this barrier. Uh, and um, uh, Brian Josephson actually then uh, sort of uh, came up with those Josephson equations essentially describing um, uh, sort of the current flow through, um, um, uh, uh, through this junction. And what he found is that the current through the junction, so I of phi, is given by some parameter I see. So this is just a constant that depends on the material I use, what's the actual size of the junction, how thick is that barrier, times the sine of phi. And the phi is actually the phase difference between the macroscopic wave function of the Cooper pair condensate on the left and on the right. So um, it's again sort of a, a quantum interference effect between those two uh, wave functions I have there. Uh, the second Josephson equation actually says that uh, if uh, I apply a voltage, um, uh, then uh, actually my phase will start to continuously evolve, um, so I'll, which in the end means I get an oscillating current. Um, so those are the, the, the two Josephson equations. From that, I can actually um, write down a voltage current relation. So, and what you find is that the voltage across this device actually depends on the time derivative of the current with some strange prefactor I'll talk about in a second. Um, who knows an electrical element who also does the same? Voltage is proportional to the time derivative of the current. Should remind you of an inductor. Um, and so, 
the main difference here, though, is that it's not just a constant I have here as a prefactor, but I have this sort of a little complicated expression with this cosine of phi in there. Again, this phase difference. So what this means is that the value of this inductance actually depends on the current flowing through that junction. So what I have here is then a so-called nonlinear inductor, um, but in, in sort of, you know, if you look at it first order, it looks very similar to an inductance. Uh, so very often people also call this the Josephson inductance. Um, another sort of thing that is, will be useful um, in sort of the later uh, lectures uh, is what's actually the energy stored in such a device. Um, and it's actually quite easy to calculate that. All we have to do is um, voltage time current gives us the power. If we integrate that over time, we get the total energy. Um, so I'll, what I do is I just take my two Josephson equations, so the IC times sine phi, put it in there, and uh, I know the voltage is the time derivative of the phase, so I also put that in. I've pushed out all of the, um, do we actually have a pointer or something? I've, I've pushed out all of the constant in front of the integral, and then all I have to do is evaluate that, so instead of integrating over T, uh, because I have this time derivative of the phase, I integrate over phi and I arrive at this final equation. And what we see is that the energy stored in such a Josephson junction is proportional to the cosine of the phase difference. Okay, so this is just something to keep in mind. We'll need that later on again. Uh, that this uh, Josephson junction is essentially a nonlinear inductance and that the energy stored in it is proportional to the cosine of the phase difference. Um, another thing uh, I sort of wanted to talk about is another phenomenon of, of superconductivity, which is essentially fluxoid quantization. Now, don't worry so much about that actual equation up there. It might look a little scary, but we'll, we'll go through it. Um, and you just have to sort of understand what it means and not really, you know, what, what is written there. So this comes from the London equation. So I just wanted to do it right. That's why I wrote it there. Um, so say I have a superconducting ring and I apply a magnetic field to it. And I want to know what happens. And what I see then is that actually I, uh, a ring current, a superconducting ring current will be induced, but in a very specific way. Uh, and this very specific way, uh, we can see if you look at these equations. So, um, so this, this first term here, this first integral is actually sort of the supercurrent in the loop. Uh, then the second term actually comes from the applied magnetic field. Ah, okay, perfect. That's much better. Um, so the second term actually comes from the applied magnetic field. And then this part here on the left is actually the gradient of the phase uh, of the wave function. So, um, and sort of the London equations tell me sort of that there is some relation between those. Uh, what is sort of uh, important uh, is that if you think about it, this wave function here, if I, if I go around this ring once and I come back to the same point, the phase has to come back to the same value because my wave function has to be single value. There's just no other way. So if I have one wave function describing this whole ring, I go around once, the phase has to be the same. So this integral here on the left, uh, sorry, on the right, can only be 2 pi n. So there's no other way. So what it actually means is that if I apply an external magnetic field, the total uh, flux through that loop will always be uh, an integer multiple of sort of this constant h over 2e, which is the so-called flux point. So um, in essence, if I apply a magnetic field, it will induce a supercurrent such that I'll get a quantized flux through that uh, uh, open area right here. So sort of the phase, sort of phase and flux in such a device are linked, and there is sort of an integer multiple of this fundamental flux quant going through that loop. So why is it interesting? Well, it turns out we can sort of um, make this ring a little more complicated and actually break it up with Josephson junctions. So now it's not a ring anymore, it's a square, but sort of you, you get the idea. 
uh, now I have a Josephson junction here, so this should indicate the barrier. Here's another Josephson junction, which should indicate the barrier. I can send current through this loop, and I can apply an external magnetic field. Now, if you think about the total current going through this device, I can just sum it up. I send current in, and it will split up, and you know, it's, it will go through the junction on the left, the junction on the right. Now, for simplification, we assume both junctions are identical. Uh, so I have just one common IC here. Uh, and then I use some trigonometric functions to rewrite these equations. So what I get is the cosine of sort of the, the phase difference um, uh, uh, across the junction and sort of the sum. And now from this flux wave quantization I've just discussed, we know that sort of the total uh, sort of phase going across here actually has to be 2 pi n. And it will be comprised of sort of the phase drop across junction one, the phase drop across junction two, and it will also be given by this external flux, by this external magnetic field I apply. Now this minus sign just uh, comes sort of from uh, my integration convention because you know I have to go around the loop for my integral. So that means, for example, that guy is positive, then I go over, and that guy will be negative. So here's the difference of the phase. Um, so now if I take this equation uh, and actually put it up here uh, into this term, what you will see is that actually all of a sudden I have a device uh, where the current, um, sort of the, the critical current in some sense, depends on the external flux I apply. Or in other words, the energy I store in that device will depend on the external magnetic field I have there. So, uh, so it means with this external field, I can tune my critical current, and I can tune this Josephson energy. So this later on will be very useful uh, for actually building qubits, uh, which we can tune in frequency using a magnetic field. OK, so this is sort of all I'm going to talk about, really sort of superconductivity or sort of things related to it. Um, um, so this was really just a very, very short overview. As I said, if you want to know more, look at these lectures, or I'm happy to talk about it. OK, so now let's actually start talking about the topic of this lecture, which is superconducting circuits. So superconducting circuits, or quantum circuits, is really sort of a combination of many things. Um, we sort of need uh, this macroscopic quantum phenomenon superconductivity to get coherence to build our devices. We need the Josephson effect, it turns out, uh, to get nonlinearity, which will allow us to do qubits. And we need this fluxoid quantization because we uh, want tunable qubits. Uh, and it turns out I can also use this to uh, make a variant of a different qubit. So there's a whole how should I say, zoo of different superconducting qubits I can realize um, uh, using uh, the Josephson junction capacitors inductances. OK, so why are superconducting circuits interesting? So what's nice about them and why? I think you've already heard about uh, a little bit about ion trap quantum computation for Christoph Wunderlich, if I have seen that correctly. So one would wonder, ion traps are a great tool, so why would I want another technology? Um, so one advantage is that uh, the qubits are actually man-made devices. I, they are built in a clean room, and so the, the advantage really is that um, we can completely engineer them. We can engineer the spectrum. Uh, we can, um, you know, we have full design flexibility. We can change all parameters we want. Uh, this is done with microfabrication, so sort of the same technology used to create microprocessors. So in principle, this is scalable. So this is nice. Um, another uh, advantage is because you know, I can build them to my liking. I can essentially engineer that dipole moment, if you want to say so. So I can make very, very strong interactions. I would say much stronger than in most other systems. Um, and another nice thing is that sort of typical energy scales for qubits and other devices is in the microwave regime. So I can do complete microwave control, and this is very nice because there's a, a whole range of commercially available components just because of mobile industry, essentially. So this is very nice. Um, of course, you know, no, no advantage. It doesn't come without a disadvantage. So 
Um, well, they are man-made objects. So all of the advantages we just discussed uh, also means there will be a spreading parameter. Essentially, it will be impossible for me to create two perfectly identical superconducting qubits, which means that you know, unlike atoms or ions, which I can perfectly use for atomic clocks, with a superconducting qubit, I claim this will never be possible, not to the same degree. So wherever I take, I don't know, a calcium ion around the world, we will have the same transition frequency if I do the experiment right. Uh, but for superconducting qubit, it will not be correct. Um, I said they are, we have very strong coupling because we can engineer that dipole moment, so this is actually great. But it's also sort of a disadvantage because I have to be careful uh, that my uh, qubit only couples to the things I want it to couple to. So I need to protect it against thermal microwave fields and other radiation. I have to avoid uh, two-level fluctuators, which is essentially dirt sort of on surfaces. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, so I need also a very good qubit design to make sure all of this works. Um, and um, what it also means is I told you uh, we con typical energy scales are somewhere in the gigahertz range. Uh, so if you think about that in terms of energy, um, we have to go pretty cold to get our system into the ground state. So typically that means cryogenic environments and something like 10 millikelvin temperatures. Um, um, so, um, in the last couple of years, this whole field in circuit QED has taken off, and there's an ever growing number of groups. So, the, the list I put up there is by no means complete. These are just a couple names, so those, those dots you should really take literal. Um, so, there's now superconducting qubits or circuits uh, working on quantum optics, quantum simulation, quantum information. Um, you can look at quantum measurement nowadays. So there's a whole host of applications um, where actually these devices work really great. Um, okay, so, so if we want to talk about quantum information processing, sort of the really minimal requirement, uh, and I really say minimal, are the DiVincenzo criteria. So maybe let's go through them step by step and see how um, superconducting qubits actually fulfill these. And this will essentially also give us a list I want to go through with you what we are trying to understand in this lecture, or, well, in the following lectures as well. Um, so we need a scalable qubit. Well, it turns out, I'll show you in a little bit that we'll have that because we have quantized energy levels in these electrical circuits, and we can make them actually very scalable because we have microfabrication. Um, we need to be able to initialize the state. Uh, so this, in our case, this means we just have to cool them down, uh, such that sort of the energy I need for sort of a, a transition, so the tr transition frequency is typically a few gigahertz, is actually much larger than the temperature I'm sitting at. And so a very useful number to remember in this context is that 20 gigahertz is about a Kelvin. So typical um, qubit frequencies are around, say, 5 to 10 gigahertz. That means that we have to go down to really ensure that these qubits are in a ground state. We have to go well below 100 millikelvin. Uh, but all of that is technology that is totally available. Um, so we also, of course, need single and two qubit operations. So we have to be able uh, to run operations. Um, this is actually almost straightforward. You have this very nice microwave control. Uh, we have this very strong coupling. So actually doing gate operations and very fast gate operations is not too difficult. Um, we have to be able to measure the state. Um, so um, we want to do this most likely in a quantum non-demolition fashion. So I want to be able to do repeated measurements. Um, so that means I have to be able to couple my qubit to some other circuit element that allows me to, me to measure its state, and we will see we can actually use microwave cavities to do that. The last thing, which I think was for uh, quite a while the, the biggest sort of, you know, people put the most effort into, was trying to increase coherence times to get them up to numbers which we can actually work with. Um, so people had to find the right superconducting materials, had to figure out how to decouple them from the environment, um, um, and sort of learn a couple of tricks and clever engineering to really make all of this work. 
Um, so we'll also, and sort of all of these points, we'll, I'll try and sort of talk a little bit about why, uh, how this is realized really in detail with superconducting qubits. You already might see that there are some sort of, you know, maybe, how should I say, discrepancies here. I want to have a strong coupling to the outside world for maybe the state measurement and the two qubit operations, but then I want to really decouple it from the environment to get along coherence time. So this really sounds like there's a contradiction here, but it turns out you just need clever engineering, clever physics to really do it right, and then it works. Um, so uh, I, I like this graph very much. This is out of uh, a science a review article by Michel de Vray and Rob Prelkopf, which sort of says, okay, how can we sort of progress towards a quantum machine, a quantum computer that is actually useful? Um, so, so um, in 2013, sort of, we are sort of, we're just sort of taking the step from, you know, we had single qubit operations, we could run algorithms on multiple qubits, we could do Q and D measurements, uh, and sort of what has been done in the last years is actually implement logical memory. So really going towards error correction and sort of trying to keep the qubit alive. Um, so this, I would say there are now two, three uh, proof of principle experiments that really show that this idea works. Now, in the lecture, I'll actually mostly be here, or I should say a little here, and mostly sort of even down there, which really talks about how do we do circuits, create qubits, uh, and essentially get the right Hamiltonian. This is, this is what it's about. Okay. Good, any questions so far? So this was all more or less a motivation. Um, so now let's see um, how we can actually start building up uh, quantum circuits, uh, how we can really quantize them, and um, sort of I'll show that on the most simple example, which is essentially a simple uh, LC oscillator. So the elements we have at our hands to build these circuits are actually three. So we'll have capacitors, uh, we have inductors, and we have this Josephson element, the Josephson junction. Now, um, for a moment, let's forget about that and stay with the simple capacitor and the simple inductors. Uh, what I'll also do is I'll consider them to be in the lumped element limit, which means that their actual physical size is much smaller than the, than the wavelength, so I don't have to take any uh, retardation effects and so on into account. Uh, and this works out quite well in our case because um, you know, the wavelength of the microwave is a few centimeters, and the typical size of these devices is a few tens, a few hundreds of microns. Okay, so now, um, sort of, this would be sort of a reminder of like physics two, sort of um, uh, electrostatics, electrodynamics. Um, so, uh, in such a capacitor, I can put charges, so I'll get a voltage drop across it, I'll have an electric field. And sort of the voltage and the charge are uh, related via the capacitance of this device, the capacitor. Uh, and I can actually calculate the energy again stored in this device. So you see this is sort of the, maybe a little bit this, the scheme. We always want to know about the energies because in the end we are interested in the Hamiltonians. Um, so the energy stored in such a capacitor, all I have to do is sort of I, I integrate um, over uh, the voltage, and I know from this relation, sort of, essentially I'm adding charges one by one, and I calculate what's the energy I get in the end out, and if I do this, I end up with this equation you should be familiar with, that the energy stored in such a capacitance is the charge squared divided by two times the capacitance. Now we can do the very same thing uh, for an inductance. So in this case, I'm actually interested in a current flowing through the device, which will create a magnetic field, uh, and which will create an effective flux through uh, this, this uh, coil. Um, so the relations are that the voltage drop uh, is actually proportional to the time derivative of the current. But now here, this is really just an inductance up front. And, of course, uh, the voltage is minus the time derivative of the phase. Uh, sorry, of the phase, of the flux. So this is really just Lenz's law. So I can combine these equations and end up 
at a relation between the flux through this coil uh, and the current, and it's again just the inductor, which is uh, in the front here. Uh, we can, again, quite simply calculate uh, what's the energy stored in this device. So I just what's, I take the power and integrate it over time. I just use these equations, put them in here, uh, and I'll end up with a very similar expression where I essentially just have to replace charge with flux and capacitance with inductance. And I'll get the total energy stored in the inductor. So this is always something which is very nice that there is this dual between capacitances and inductors um, where I just take charges and replace them with a flux. I take a capacitance and replace them with an uh, inductance. OK, so we have those two elements. We know the energy in them. So now let's combine them and build a LC oscillator. So uh, we just you know, put them in parallel. We hook them up with the wire. Uh, what we get then is a resonant circuit, and it turns out, um, and I sort of justify this in the following, that we can actually view the energy stored in the inductor as a kind of potential energy, uh, and I can view the energies in the, in the capacitance effectively as a kinetic energy. Um, it turns out I could also swap them uh, if I would like to. The physics I'll get out will be the same. Um, it turns out that later on this will be the slightly more intuitive picture. Um, so in some sense, oops, this should actually point to the, uh, to, the, to the flux here. So in some sense, the flux will be like my coordinate, and the charge will be like my momentum. So what I can do now is I can actually write down a Lagrangian uh, of, this, of this system where I uh, just take uh, kinetic energy minus my potential energy. Uh, and uh, so I have uh, this sum, or actually I subtract one from the other. Um, then to arrive on the right side, I just put in that my charge is uh, capacitance times voltage, or I know that my voltage is minus the time derivative of the time derivative of the flux. I can put all of that in here and sort of arrive at this equation. Um, now, what I can do from Euler Lagrange, I can actually get uh, my differential equation. And you should be very familiar with this differential equation. Sort of, uh, it's just like for a harmonic oscillator. You know, the second time derivative of the flux is actually minus some constant times uh, the flux. So just a harmonic oscillator equation. So you know the solutions to that. Um, and we actually also know what the resonance frequency of such a device will be. Uh, it's just given by the square root of this prefactor right out here. So this LC oscillator is really um, identical to your regular harmonic oscillator. So if you know the physics of a harmonic oscillator, you pretty much know the physics of this LC oscillator. It's really, it's really the same. Um, one more thing is actually quite nice, uh, which makes it all work in the end, is actually charge and flux or conjugate variables. Uh, so this will really allow us to sort of, again, transfer all of this into a, a quantum picture, because uh, we can now uh, also, of course, because we have the Lagrangian, so we can easily calculate our Hamiltonian. Um, so if you then just walk through here. You can have a look at these equations yourself. It's actually quite easy to follow. Uh, just you know, do what's written here. Uh, what you'll find is that what we get out is pretty much exactly what we would expect. What else? Uh, that the total Hamiltonian of the system is given by the energy stored in the capacitance plus the energy stored in the inductor. So no surprise there uh, for sort of this very, very simple system. And now, yes. Essentially, uh, exactly. I'll, I'll make a, a, a comparison in, in a minute again. Exactly. In principle, it's like um, if you take the position of your regular harmonic oscillator, it's equivalent to uh, the, the flux through the inductor. And sort of the momentum of your harmonic oscillator translates into the charge here. So there's really sort of, if you sort of do this, um, how should I say, replacement, then all the physics stays the same. 
and it's sort of all the intuition you have for your quantum harmonic oscillator, for your harmonic oscillator, you can translate to there. Um, so now we can sort of quite easily uh, make, uh, uh, so we can sort of, sort of do what we always do in sort of quantum physics a little bit, is we can sort of replace our charge with a charge operator. We can replace the flux with a flux operator. And the, um, because charge and flux are conjugate variables, also the commutation relation will turn out to be exactly uh, minus IH bar, or if I flip them, IH bar. So what I get is actually a Hamiltonian where I have the charge operator squared divided by 2C plus the flux operator squared divided by 2L. Um, so, ha, yes, I, I skipped over that. That's a, that, yes, absolutely, very, very, very good, very good remark, absolutely right. So actually, this is again where, where actually, you know, superconductivity also comes in. Because now, you know, this will be a collective effect of all of our Cooper pairs, but this is one macroscopic wave function, so this will be totally fine, actually, it turns out. Yeah. Yeah, but very, very fair point. Um, now, I already said that, um, you know, I treat charge and flux as position and momentum, so I can just, again, do the same thing I do for quantum harmonic oscillators. I can introduce raising and lowering operators um, such that my flux is A plus A dagger, my charge is A minus A dagger with a minus I up front, and I have this now a little strange looking prefactor. There is no mass and resonance frequency anymore, but there is this so-called characteristic impedance, which is just given by the square root of the inductance divided by the capacitance. Um, so if I now take this and actually, uh, oh yeah, uh, I forgot to mention, actually this prefactor out front actually tells you what is uh, the zero point fluctuation of the charge or the flux. Um, so this is essentially related to the ground state size of, of our LC oscillator. So I can then take these equations and put them into the previous Hamiltonian and what I get out is no surprise uh, the regular Hamiltonian for a quantum harmonic oscillator um, where essentially I have my parabolic potential, but this time it's not in the position, but it's sort of in the flux, and I'll get my discrete energy levels uh, that walk up there. Um, just as an add-on, I can also calculate ground state sizes, and they are really related to uh, these prefactors right out here, if you would calculate this uh, from, from the above equations. So what I want you to take away is really that we have this dual, okay? So that if you know the physics of the thing on the right, which I guess most of you have done in, in quantum physics sort of one, um, then you know how, how the LC oscillator on the left works. So if you look at those two Hamiltonians, it's really very much the same. Its, it's position goes over into charge. It turns out mass is transferred into capacitance. Um, uh, position becomes flux. I get the very same commutation relations. Uh, I can write down the same raising and lowering operators doing the same replacements. Um, I can calculate a resonance frequency. Here it's given by square root. Uh, K over M, so spring constant and mass. Here it's one over square root inductance times capacitance. In addition, what people use here is this characteristic impedance. Uh, I could write down something similar for the mechanics. I'm not so sure it actually makes a lot of sense to do that, but in principle, one could. Um, and sort of the takeaway message is all of that in the end is described by this Hamiltonian. Okay. Um, now, how am I doing? Okay, actually not, not too good. Um, so, okay, we have this device. Now the question is, how can we actually learn about its properties? Um, it turns out all I have to do is I have to hook it up to the outside world. How do I do that? Well, I could attach wires. Turns out that's not ideal. That's sort of a too strong connection to the outside world. I want to sort of do some weak coupling. So what I introduce is sort of these, these capacitances right here. 
and I can send signals in from the left, so microwave signal in from the left, and I can, for example, look at what comes out of the right side. Um, now these capacitors actually tell me how well is my system coupled to the outside world. Um, uh, and uh, so it will tell me about the losses in the system, because if I have some excitation living in here, I can sort of go out this direction or that direction. And how easy that is depends on the size of the capacitance. Uh, typically, just for simplification, sort of this in and output is combined to just one so-called coupling, uh, um, coupling rate to the outside world. Uh, very often, though, I'm also interested is uh, how much energy do I actually lose internally here? So maybe this picture is not quite correct, and I don't have a perfect capacitance, I don't have a perfect inductance, but you know, I have some maybe additional lossy elements there because of some imperfections. Uh, and I'm sort of interested in sort of the total quality factor maybe. Um, so how can I learn about all of these parameters? Well, it turns out all I have to do is I measure the spectrum, meaning I take my input signal, I vary its frequency, and check what I get out here on the right. Sorry, yeah. No, I don't need a junction here. This is, no, 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 no junctions here yet. So this is a simple wind the coil, make two parallel plates, um, can be big, make it macroscopic, make it out of a superconductor, um, and you'll get uh, something that you can cool into the quantum regime. Um, now, um, sort of what we, if you want to learn, yes. Say the, the, the loss rate? Oh, um, um, so ideally, uh, gamma in and gamma out are only losses, and all I get is then the sort of related dephasing, but no excess dephasing. Um, the gamma internal, I would say, typically is a loss rate, but could also be dephasing. So there you could have an additional dephasing term on top of just regular, of regular dephasing. Uh, but sort of, if we measure gamma, what we get out in the end is just uh, uh, we don't get the sort of T1 out. We will measure T2. So we'll measure the dephasing rate of the device, it turns out. So because those are sort of the Fourier transform of each other. Um, so uh, if you want to measure such a device, we can sort of send things in and we can record what comes out. And this is essentially uh, input-output formalism from quantum physics. Now, instead of light, as an input field, I take microwave signals, but all the rest, all the description will be completely identical. So what I, in the end, really want to do is I really want to measure, OK, what do I send in? What gets reflected back? Uh, what comes out the other end? Uh, what if I send it in that way? What do I get out here, sort of the reflection? Or what do I get out the other side? Um, so I want to measure typically transmission and reflection. And what you will see then is uh, that uh, these curves versus frequency are essentially Lorentzians. So far away from the resonance of this device, actually all the power I sent there will be perfectly bounced back to me. So reflection here should be 1. Then at resonance, I actually manage to put energy into the device. And now it can leak out also the other side. Uh, so I'll, I'll find this dip, uh, and then again, the reflectance will come back up to a value of 1. If I look at the transmittance, I'll see the reverse picture. Sort of at first, I you know, can't even get anything in here. It just bounces off. Then at resonance, I manage to excite this device, uh, and then it can sort of send out uh, photons uh, also the other way, and I actually find a peak in my transmission signal. Now. From such a measurement, I can actually learn what's the resonance frequency of my resonator, which tells me about the Hamiltonian already. But I can learn more, uh, which is I can learn about what's the total uh, dissipation I have, which will be given by the line width, and what's the ratio uh, of this coupling uh, rate to my total rate, which will be given by this dip here. So from doing such a spectroscopy, I can really learn all the relevant parameters uh, of my device. Uh, now, just sort of to uh, add some um, um, sort of um, 
uh, well, to add some, some um, uh, words uh, very often used is sort of to, uh, people usually don't talk about loss rates necessarily. They very often talk about quality factors, but those are just trivially related by uh, taking the resonance frequency and dividing it by the loss rate. This is the so-called quality factor. Um, and we've already mentioned that. Actually, to keep in mind, gamma really describes the phasing rate of the resonator. So it doesn't mean it's the energy loss, uh, sort of, this gamma. Uh, so really, it's the phasing rate and gamma that are sort of the Fourier transform of each other. Um, so and now this quality factor um, so can be either sort of you can have these coupling losses, which very, much, very often can be actually desired. I want to be able to get signals in and signals out. Uh, but we'll also have these internal losses, and those are typically undesired losses. Ideally, it should be a perfect oscillator, and only my coupling should make it worse. And there's many, many reasons uh, why we can have these losses, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, so I think I just have uh, some time to show you some actual devices. Um, so, so this is actually a picture from Leo Di Caldo's group in Delft. So here, those meandering lines here are actually resonators. They are now of a slightly different form than what I talked about. They are uh, so-called coplanar waveguide resonators. So these lines here, I've drawn a sketch down. They are what they are. So you have a ground plane. Essentially, what you do is you take a coax cable and you squish it flat on a two-dimensional plane. So you have a ground plane here on the top, a ground plane here on the bottom, and a center pin actually carrying your microwave signal. Now what I do to that center pin is I interrupt it at two locations and make the length between those two interruptions exactly lambda half. So what I get then is a standing wave of the electric field right here. So this is then my fundamental resonance, just a lambda half resonance, but I'll get, of course, at uh, sort of two times the frequency, three times the frequency, and so on, I get a whole comb of resonances for this device. That's a, like a cavity, like a Fabry Perot cavity in some sense, yes. Um, and you can really view those gaps here as your mirrors, and depending on how big you make those gaps, it changes the reflectivity of your mirrors pretty much. So I can send microwaves in, I can get microwaves out. Um, sort of typical length here is sort of lambda half, so a, a few centimeters. Other dimensions are sort of uh, like a, a few tens of micrometers is the gap here, and the film thickness is at most a typical, at most a couple hundred nanometers. Um, now, with these kind of resonators, sort of state of the art, the best thing people can do is get quality factors of about 10 to the 6, somewhere in that range. Um, another variant of a resonator is let's make uh, a box out of a superconductor. Well, I don't need, necessarily need to use a superconductor. It will just improve my quality factors. So here, this is just a three-dimensional box, a so-called wave, uh, waveguide microwave resonator. Uh, and in this box, I just have to fulfill Maxwell's boundary conditions. Um, so um, if you look at the fundamental mode of this resonator, it looks something like this. I have an electric field maximum in the middle. Um, the electric field goes to, the, to zero on the side, and it sort of points uh, upward. Um, and I, again, have many, many modes in this device, just like you would have in a drum. I, again, can sort of send microwave signals in and out, so you can put some couplers here, which would attach to SMA cables, so you can send microwaves into the device, get microwaves out. Um, again, you'll have multiple resonances, and the resonance frequencies are actually given by this equation here. Now, what is nice in these devices is they are uh, very easy to make. You can literally go into the workshop yourself if you know how to, to operate a mill. Um, machine out those two halves, bolt them together, make them cold, uh, and you'll see cold means, of course, below a Kelvin. Um, um, and you'll get quality factors of like 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 7. So this is actually quite nice. Um, there's other variants. So you can do something similar. You can sort of uh, what I call Coke can resonator. You sort of, it literally looks like a Coke can. It's also about, almost about the same size. Um, and with such a device, if you think about uh, how to do it right, you can get quality factors in excess of 10 to the 8. So those are among the highest quality factors anyone has done uh, for microwave resonators 
The only exception are social roaches cavities, which are even better. Um, and well, and then there's other variants, just to uh, tell you there's a whole, whatever you want to do, you can sort of pick your resonator that suits you. There's uh, other uh, resonators which are really sort of take a coax cable pretty much and sort of make, short it out at the end and make this center pin lambda quarter long. Um, so this would be sort of a lambda quarter resonator. People have seen quality factors of 10 to the 7. Uh, you can also make the actual device we have discussed, which is this lumped element resonator. So you have your meandering line here, which is an inductance. You have your finger capacitors. So really, resonance frequency of this is not a geometric factor that, that determines it, but it's really inductance times capacitance. And in this case, the whole size of that thing is a few hundred microns, so much smaller than the wavelength. The disadvantage here is actually these guys have quality fact, have sort of the lowest quality factors of the whole bunch, which is only 10 to the 5. And I guess with that, I should end. Um, so um, in the next lecture, we'll, I'll sort of give you a quick idea on why we have these big differences in quality factors and where they come from. And then we'll actually start talking about how we can use the same tricks sort of uh, we have used so far to build a superconducting qubits and sort of understand a little bit how, how this thing works and how we can couple it to, to other devices. Yes, please. Uh, in, in principle, yes. Uh, um, in practice, I'd say um, in the community, people uh, use only a few. Um, so aluminum. Uh, niobium, um, uh, niobium, titanium nitride, and that's it. Uh, it's, it's sort of, it, there's a couple of things. So, so um, for example, people don't use high TC superconductors because they are typically ceramics, and they are not easy to machine, not easy to grow, and it seems like they wouldn't give an apparent advantage. So people have tried building, say, coplanar waveguides out of high TCs, they didn't see a difference. Um, so, and then it's not worth the effort to actually make, you know, this much more complicated fabrication for no gain. <laughs> yes? Oh, yes. No, no. Uh, totally, you can use classical fields. Absolutely. I mean, it turns out your, your harmonic oscillator it's a quantum system, yes, but it's a very classical quantum system. I mean, just by itself, if you only have a harmonic oscillator at your disposal and no other non-classical input state or, or non-classical device, you'll never ever see anything but classical physics, even though it's a quantized system. But I mean, if you drive it with a classical drive, you just see a coherent state in it. So, but still, to get the energy out, which, I mean, is, is just fine. I mean, can, I can find the resonance, and this is all I need to know to fully determine my Hamiltonian, pretty much. And if I want to know more, uh, like, okay, what I need for a master equation, I can look at the losses, and this is also given from this classical spectroscopy. Or, yeah. So you so, sort of go back a little bit? Ah. You, you mean the, the, the ground state fluctuations? Oh, well, the, those are just, I mean, given because it's a quantum state. I mean, your, 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 if, you look at the, the, if you look at your regular quantum harmonic oscillator, then your, your, your ground state um, I mean, if you calculate expectation value of position and momentum, well, this is well defined, that's zero. But if you look at the variance, then, you know, the ground state size has an extension, and this is just the same here. And instead of the ground state size having an extension in sort of position and momentum, this time here for a, such a uh, device is in charge and flux. Okay, but otherwise there's no, no real difference here. Or, what was the, or maybe I misunderstood the question. Ah. Ah, sorry, yeah. 
Uh, sure, okay, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, but that's sort of all going towards how do I improve coherence times pretty much. Yes, yes, of course. I mean, this was the biggest initial problem with this whole technology that initial devices had coherence times of a few nanoseconds. Uh, meanwhile, we are up at like 100 microseconds, even up to milliseconds nowadays for some devices. So this is plenty enough to do everything we want because gate operations are really fast. Um, yeah. Sorry. Yes, absolutely. 